Ed White, first American to walk in space. Roger Chaffee, U-2 spy plane pilot from the Cuban Missile Crisis. Gus Grissom, the first man ever chosen to make three trips to space. NASA's first Apollo crew suited up for one last test, a full simulated launch with a command module bolted on top of the Saturn 1B rocket, sealed off and pressurized with pure oxygen. The day of the fire was a bad day uh, from a test point of view. Everything seemed to go wrong that day. They almost decided to cancel the test that day, but they had the spacecraft all ready and they had the pressure system, the environmental control system going. And so they decided, well, we'll go ahead with the test. I sat right there, right up this console. I was sitting there when it happened. Apollo 1, scheduled to lift off 25 days later, was planned as the first of six rapid fire launches as America raced to put a man on the moon by spring of 1968. Put the uh, Apollo 1 disaster in focus, I'd say all of us had go fever. We were really committed to going to the moon and back. Not just NASA, the contractors, the politicians. After his Gus was tapped to command Apollo's maiden voyage. While Gus had complete confidence in his crewmates, he had his doubts about the new Apollo command module. He thought the spacecraft was a lemon. Gus had picked up a California lemon, and I live in California, I know their lemons are big, and hung one on the side of the spacecraft, meaning it was a lemon. A lot of people have said, well, why didn't he just tell them, I'm not gonna do this? But that's, that's not the way of somebody that's trying to work and correct things. You stay with it and you try to make it work. That was the only way Gus would have handled it. I mean, he wouldn't walk away from a problem like that. Apollo 1 was the most complex aviation vehicle man had ever devised. The command module was a maze of electronics, crammed with 15 miles of wiring. For the astronauts, the greatest flaw in Apollo's design was NASA's attempt to fix the one component that had failed on Liberty Bell 7, the escape hatch. We didn't like the hatch. We didn't like how long it took to open and close, and we were complaining about that didn't have a, a real quick opening. It took time and took a lot of force to open this thing. And instead of being pressured in, it was pressured out. The hatch was closed from the inside. And when the spacecraft was pressurized, it would have taken a herd of elements to open that hatch. At 1.19 in the afternoon, Gus and his crew prepared to be locked into a spacecraft filled with pure oxygen. To clear the cabin of any contamination, the capsule would be pressurized, pumped up 15% above normal. That put us in a position of sitting on the pad in a bomb pure oxygen at 20 PSI. That's a bomb. But we got away with that uh, all through Mercury, and we got away from it all through Gemini, and we got complacent to that danger. Okay, uh, command pilot, do you read? Interference made communication a nightmare. Uh, you're pretty garbled here, uh, Gus. 
senior pilot, uh, can you hear us? Okay, you're worth 6.31 that evening, as communications crackled between capsule and control room, electric current coursed through hundreds of circuits. Beneath Grissom's couch, wires chafed against bare metal. A spark flashed. You could hear somebody yell, there's a fire. Somebody else yell, get me out of here. And then it was quiet. Trapped by the hatch, Gus and the crew had no hope of escape. Fueled by pure oxygen, Apollo 1 became a blast furnace. It would be eight long minutes before the hatch could be opened. For Grissom, Chaffee, and White, the end came in 14 seconds. Gus Grissom and Ed White and Roger Chaffee lost their lives before they ever even got off the ground. Uh, their booster wasn't even fueled. They were in a, they were in a, in a pre-launch test. It shouldn't have happened like that. And uh, I think uh, not that it would have been any easier if it had been in space, but I think you could have understood it a little better. When the fire happened, it, it hit me pretty hard. Because when you know these fellows so much, so you know that you're very close to them. Three good buddies uh, incinerated. But for us, sitting on a live rocket is another day in the office. And it is an occupational hazard that everybody in the business accepts because the riches to be gained from pressing on are well above any of the risks that you accept. That's one of those kind of things that you uh You never forget where you were and what you were doing. Once again, the nation turned to Arlington National Cemetery to mourn fallen heroes. President Johnson and Grissom's family sat side by side in grief. Today, Apollo 1's launch pad stands as a silent relic of the space race. In the aftermath of the deaths of Grissom, Chaffee and White, the moon program was put on hold. Every aspect of the Apollo command module was scrutinized, every flaw redesigned. There was a lot of things wrong with that spacecraft. And had the fire not happened, I'm convinced in my own mind we would never have gotten to the moon in the 60s. I think that because we had the fire, because we had the hiatus, because we had the time, we were then able to uh, plow in the lessons learned from Gemini, particularly, into the redesign of the Apollo spacecraft. And I'm convinced that that's what made Apollo successful. So it was a very ironic thing with Grissom. Hatch almost killed him in, in Red Mercury Redstone 4 and did kill him in Apollo. <laughs> 